teachings Bhagavad Gita. Gita means song, song of God, so it's the spoken word of Lord Krishna and um, <clears throat> so it's a very important book to give us a very deep understanding of who am I, why am I here, uh, where do I come from and why I'm suffering. These are the four questions of human life, you know, we, we, we we're not animals, um, so we have this higher intelligence <clears throat> to ask these questions. Eating, sleeping, mating and defending, that's what the animals do. <laughs> so if that's all we do, uh, then we, as Prabhupada says, we're two-legged animals. So what are we meant to do? We're meant to inquire about Brahman, Atato Brahma Jigyasa. Uh, now that I've got this human form of life, I need to inquire about spirit. So Bhagavad Gita especially gives us this wonderful information that who is God? Uh, what is he doing? What does he look like? What is his address? Who are his friends? Yeah? Very personal, intimate in relationship uh, we all have with Krishna. And as Prabhupada says, if we try to love Krishna, if we become convinced that Krishna is our intimate friend and protector. Convinced. Convinced means no doubt. Um, then we can experience real happiness. As long as there's some doubt, you know, uh, that, oh, yes, Krishna, the consciousness is very nice, but I like some other things too, yeah? <laughs> Let me do a bit of this and a bit of that, yeah? What does that mean? That means you're not convinced. Convinced means no doubt. One way. The Krishna way. Why? Because he's my intimate friend and protector. Who else is my intimate friend and protector besides Krishna? Nobody. Hmm? So when you're convinced like that, uh, then you can be happy. You can be peaceful. Otherwise not. That is just the way it is. Yeah? So <clears throat> how do we increase our faith then? That is the thing, isn't it? How do I remove my doubts? Um, how do I stop giving my energy to things that do not serve my soul? Huh? Wasted energy, wasted time. That is, that is what's required. How do I stop doing that which is not serving my soul? Because that's our choice. It's our choice that we give our time and our energy to this or that. Nobody is forcing you to do that. It's your choice. But Guru comes and says, give everything to Krishna. Give all your time, give all your energy, give everything, give your heart. Then you are the winner. Then you are successful. So we need to become convinced of that, you know. And how do you do that? You become convinced when you associate with those that are convinced. The pure devotee. How do we associate with a saint? It doesn't mean you sit next to him. It means you serve him. That's how you associate with him. You can be with him just by serving him. Because he's not a 
material personality. He's a transcendental personality. That means he's in your heart all the time, provided your heart is with him. Yeah? What does that mean? You want to serve him. You want to please him. Then you can be with him. And what does that mean? That means that you will begin to come to understand that you are eternal servant of Krishna. Jivera Sarupa Nitya Krishna Das Krishna Tatasta Shakti Beta Beta Prakash. Who am I? What is my real identity? I am the eternal servant of Krishna. I don't have two identities. Uh, this we need to be convinced of, you know. Why? Because then we start giving our energy one way, one way, not here, there, everywhere. Hmm. Why do something which is not good for you? Why do something which is not really going to be, bring you real uh, satisfaction? Why waste your time and energy doing that? Um, so Bhagavad Gita is that book which can give us this encouragement. <clears throat> So we're reading a chapter today, the third chapter, uh, called Divine Communion Through Dedicated Service. So Krishna is speaking to his intimate friend uh, and devotee Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. This is history as well as great teaching. Arjuna then said, O Master, protect all the people. You, t- you appear to be of the opinion that pure contemplation is superior to active life. Why then do you push me forward into this horrific effort at civil war? Your words seem inconclusive and my intellect cannot come into focus unless you affirm more singularly that course of action which will produce the greatest good. The Lord, who is the reservoir of all beauty, replied, O my pure-hearted friend, I have said that in this world there are two types of diligent seekers who come at last to communion with the Supreme. The contemplators who try to understand the Supreme Truth through the cultivation of scientific theistic knowledge and the persons of action who strive to work with all devotion for the pleasure of a supreme person. By merely abandoning action, a person can neither become purified from the taint of previous misdeeds nor achieve a position transcendental to the laws of action and reaction. The state of perfection can never be attained through external renunciation alone. No one can be without engagement even for an instant since the quality of nature is that all are forced to act. Those who attempt to restrict themselves from action on the sensory plane while cherishing the memory of sense pleasure are hypocrites and they act through false pretense. Those who balance the action of the mental and sensual spheres by full engagement of all their faculties in selfless devotional activities are by far more highly evolved. Rather than yield to an action, it is better to perform those actions which are required of you which are necessary and unavoidable. Without proper engagement, even bodily health will deteriorate. One's endeavors should arise out of a spirit of sacrifice and devotion to the all-pervasive Supreme Divine Person. Action performed for other reasons binds one to the wheel of birth and death. My dear Kanteya, please perfect within yourself the spirit of acting only for the pleasure of the Supreme, as such a spirit constitutes in itself full liberation. In primeval times, the Supreme Divine Person, the source of all that lives, having manifested the first of the generations, blessed them and taught them this doctrine of selfless divine service. They were told that through the pure endeavor of divine sacrifice, they would become wealthy, and all that they could ever possibly desire would come to them. The devas, the subordinate gods, who are the empowered controllers of the cosmic functions, being pleased by their devotional efforts would in turn please them. Through such divine cooperation, all would gain their fair share of wealth, and blessings of all descriptions would descend upon the land. Working in cooperation and love, everyone will at last come to the supreme destination. The devas will certainly provide humanity with the delivery of their daily bread when they see their spirit of self-sacrifice. On the other hand, those who seek to exploit the gifts of nature without assuming their cosmic responsibilities are no better than thieves. When foodstuffs are produced in such a devotional way, they have an uplifting and liberating effect on the saints who consume them, but the meals of selfish persons, cooked without thought for others, implicate the eaters in the violence of the food chain, keep them bound in reaction and guilty of blame. All living beings require foodstuffs to sustain them, and for food, rains are required. 
When human society is engaged in selfless service, then the rain will not fail to come in proper time and measure. Selfless action has its roots in the Supreme Divine Person, from whom the Divine Logos emanates in the living form of the transcendental sound of real truth. Therefore, the all of Supreme Person may always be communicated with through the selfless performance of the revealed sacrifices. My dear child Raprita, those who are satisfied by a superficial life of sense pleasure, neglecting the scriptures, waste their valuable human lives. But those who come to taste the real flavor of their eternal spiritual personalities, who are illumined by awareness of the spirit self, and are fully satisfied by engagement in spiritual activities, transcend all mundane obligations. Actions should not arise from selfish motives, and neither should renunciation. Furthermore, one must never exploit others for one's own gain. A person who engages continuously in selfless devotional labors, acting out of spontaneous necessity to render service, achieves the supreme destination without fail. It was through selflessly serving with devotion that great rulers such as Janak and others came to the plane of perfection. You should also give light to the whole world by executing your responsibilities in a similar spirit. Whatever great and cultured persons do, the general populace runs to imitate. The people naturally follow what they learn from leaders. My dear child of Prita, no action I take anywhere throughout the galaxies is enforced upon me by duty, and I am in need of nothing. Yet still, <coughs> excuse me, I always go on with my service. If I ever fail to do what is expected of me, all humankind would follow in my footsteps. <coughs> Excuse me. Were I to fault in my service, the whole world would follow my example and be ruined. I would be responsible for degradation in the flow of generations. Persons without information as to the nature of proper action act selfishly and divisively, whereas the truly wise perform their service selflessly, <coughs> with a view, excuse me, to inspire and unite the whole world. <coughs> One should not confuse the minds of the unenlightened who are attached to selfish works by encouraging them to become inactive. They must be inspired instead to act in devotion. Sorry, <coughs> I'm having a problem. Anyone else yeah, want to read? Can anyone else read? Or get some water, please? <coughs> Souls allow their false egos to transform them into fools, and who are ignorant of the real nature of the self, consider themselves to be the cause of their own actions and the results those actions bring. In actual fact, all worldly actions arise on account of the dynamic interweaving of the binding forces of material nature. A true master remains always selfless beyond the influence of the binding forces of nature. Such a soul never becomes implicated in the cycle of desire and fulfillment. Lazy persons who make no effort to cultivate the spirit Thanks. Uh, remain fooled by the magical powers of my external nature and implicated in the reactive chain produced by selfish acts. Nonetheless, the wise should act gently with them, rendering your service to me in consciousness fully illuminated by the light of revelation, free from profit motive, put out the fires of nihilism and go forward into battle. Anyone who acts continuously and selflessly with full faith and devotion to me and with compassion for all beings is at once free from the cycle of action-reaction. Those self-centered persons who fail to understand the importance of my teachings remain fools despite their so-called learning and their consciousness is always troubled. Once you try to act in a natural way, for that is the true attainment of the wise, no one can oppose their own nature the positive and negative attractions which the sensory objects exercise over the senses are produced by the effects of ancient subtle impressions within the mind stuff. One must avoid being dominated by such external stimuli inasmuch as such attachments and aversions represent the major obstacles on the path of transcendence. By adopting a superior conception of action, we are led to conclude that one should follow the law of one's own innermost being, escaping the temptation to depart from that and follow the path of another. It is better to fail while trying to be oneself than to succeed in becoming someone else. Arjuna then felt inspired to ask, O pillar of the Rishi dynasty, how is it that people sometimes seem forced to blameful actions against their own higher instincts? Even despite their conscious resolution, they appear to be driven just as lifeless things may be driven by wind or water. Lord Krishna, the proprietor of all opulence, replied, 
Self-centered sense desire, born of the impassioning force of external nature and easily converted to, convertible to anger, is the all-destructive, all-entangling foe in this world. Each conditioned soul is covered in some degree by an element of passionate sense desire. For some it is like the covering of fire by smoke, for others it is like the coating of a mirror with dust, whilst for others it resembles the enclosure of the embryo within the darkness of the womb. In this way the soul's pure consciousness is found to be burning in the flames ignited by the foe in the form of impassioned sense desire. The foe resides in one's own mind and senses, and from that hiding place blinds one inner vision and causes the growth of a myriad of misconceptions. You are the best amongst the descendants of Bharat, and I therefore implore you to supervise carefully the activities of your senses. Defeat this foe who has come to eclipse your natural wisdom. The sensory platform is subordinate to the mental sphere, which in turn is subordinate to the pure intellect. The position of the spirit self, however, is still more sublime and powerful. A mighty armed friend, it lies with you to conquer this deadly foe by balancing your mental and intellectual functions with a clearer vision of the transcend, this transcendent reality. Hmm. So, in this chapter, Krishna talks about everyone working in cooperation and love, like that. Um, so, the times that we live in are very much uh, troubled. Um, this is called the Age of Kali, uh, Kali Yuga. And it is characterized by quarrel, two things particularly, quarrel and hypocrisy. Um, so we don't see that people work in cooperation and love. Um, there's a lot of conflict uh, in relationships, in uh, personal relationships, marriages, uh, conflict in between family members, uh, and then as it gets bigger, uh, conflict between different uh, social groups, different community groups, and of course, uh, on a big scale, conflict and war. Um, uh, you've probably seen, I, when I go to gym, I sometimes see on the TV, you know, what's been going on in Syria, the civil war, uh, bombing, you know, people just living in total fear and destruction. And it's been going on now for, for years, you know. Um, so such a quarrelsome time we live in, where people are so filled with hatred that they kill each other, they bomb each other, you know. Their own countrymen, even children, yeah, they bomb, they kill, maim. It's can you imagine the hatred to to do that? You know what what must be the feeling that you have to to go out and, and kill? You know, um, so this is this is a terrible time. Uh, I mean, the United Nations, as Prabhupada says, is not united at all. There's been war all the time for, for, since time immemorial. You know? There's no peace. Um, so, like I say, it's on it's on a small scale. We see divorce, divorce, divorce everywhere. Uh, families break up, family disturbance, communities, uh, religious groups, uh, quarrel, 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 uh, fighting. Chess fighting. <laughs> yeah. So we we are we are not cats and dogs. No, we shouldn't be behaving like cats and dogs. Yeah, cats and dogs fight. That's their nature. But human beings, no. Why are we fighting? Where's the shortage? Yeah, there's no shortage. As Prabhupada says, there's no shortage of anything. These, these wars are about land and resources. Yeah? People thinking, this is my land. It's not your land, it's Krishna's land. It doesn't belong to you. Hmm? This madness. Uh, so this is not human life. This is animal life. Uh, so much quarrel. So, uh, but in, in this chapter, Krishna is saying that that real spiritual life, real human life, means that we work in cooperation and love. Yeah? Everyone's cooperating. How can I help you? How can you help me? Do what? Serve Krishna. When Krishna is the center, then we can have cooperation. When God is the center of our personal lives, our community lives, 
our national lives, when Krishna is the center, then there'll be cooperation, then there'll be love. But right now, there's no common center. This one's got his own agenda, that one's got his own agenda. They got, there's no common center, isn't it? No. And even religious groups, uh, because there's different kinds of religion, higher and lower level of religion. Until we know God correctly, how can we love Him? And if you don't love Him, how are you going to love His creatures, His children? Hmm? Then it's just poo-poo. It's just blah blah. I love God, but in the meantime, I'm killing innocent animals to to eat. Hmm? Is that love of God? Yes, I love God. I'm a Christian. Hmm? But where's my steak today? Hmm? Where's my meat? Hmm? Is that love? How can you say that you love God when you don't love His creatures? That's not love. Why? Because you don't know who God is. So everyone come, needs to come to know who God is. Otherwise, what is, the, what is religion? It's meaningless. It's meaningless. Religion means the law of God. If you don't know who God is, how can you know and love Him? Not possible. So Krishna consciousness tells, as Prabhu was quoting that verse from 18th chapter, Give up all other conceptions of religious duties, laws and duties. Give them up. And just surrender unto me. That's what Krishna says. Krishna is speaking himself and says, give up all other conceptions of religious laws and duties and surrender to me. So this is necessary. Yeah? And until that happens, even between religious groups, we'll have war. How many religious wars have we had? Hmm? Plenty. Even now, India, Pakistan, Muslim, Hindu, hmm? bombing temples, bombing. Yeah? It is all the same God. It's the same Lord. It's the same Lord. But, but if you are not actually learning to love Him in, in, in reality, then your so-called religious practice is, not, is cheating. It's actually cheating. So if you think I can go to the temple or the synagogue or the mosque, and wear a nice suit, yeah? and smile at everybody, and put some money in the till, and I'm a religious person. Yeah. What do you know about God? Hmm? So that's not religion, that's cheating. But if you are following a process that awakening your love of God, oh, I'm coming to know who God is. What is His name? What does He look like? What is His address? What are His friends? And what is my relationship with Him? Hmm? That is genuine religion. So without that, we are simply uh, still in the dark. Mm? And when there's darkness, there's conflict, you know. That's why there's these religious wars. So that's why Krishna says, Sarva dhamman paricha jamame kam sharanam raja aham tvam sava pape bhiva maksha yishami mahasitra. Give up all other conceptions of religious laws and duties and surrender to me. He's speaking, God is speaking. So who can say... Who is he? Why should I listen to him? <laughs> if you don't have faith that he's God, that's another thing. Hmm? That's another thing. If you don't what have no faith. Sanskrit. Sanskrit. Yeah. Sanskrit is the oldest language. It's a spiritual language, beautiful language. So <clears throat> it's helpful to understand these things because then we can start understanding this world a little bit. Why is there so much craziness, so much nonsense? Why? You know, we can understand that it's because People do not understand, firstly, that I'm not this body, I'm the soul. Even that people struggle. You know, I went down, I give out these little flyers, you know, to, to, to pass on the message. And I was down here by uh, the lagoon. And I go to one lady, <clears throat> she was a very smart lady with a nice car and well-dressed and everything. You know, obviously educated. And I said, you know, here's a flyer, this is Goranga, this is Krishna. Um, and... Uh, she says, no, I don't believe that the soul, I don't believe in the soul. There's no soul, huh? You see? So this is difficult. She, we live in... she, she doesn't believe in anything, really. Just, you know, do your best, get by. Huh? So um, this is the world we live in, that even people don't understand that, that, that there's the soul, that I'm not this body, you know, wow. Never mind talk about the Supreme Soul, God. They don't even uh, believe that I'm the soul mm -hmm. and that I'm not this body. This is difficult. So, the first step to at least believe that there's a soul. 
exactly the first step. First step, first step. As first Prabhupada says, if you if you wanna if you wanna know what the ocean what is the ocean, you know? Go take a drop of water out of the ocean, just one drop, and analyze it. Because the quality of that one drop of water is the same as the ocean, isn't it? The quality is the same, not the quantity, but the quality is the same. So the same thing, before I can even understand God, I need to understand that tiny soul, that small spiritual particle, which is me, yeah? And then I can begin to understand, by the grace of the Supreme Soul, who I am and my relationship. How do you help that woman? Yeah, we talk about <clears throat> people, you know, who are not really wanting or don't, don't, are not ready to hear this philosophy. Bhagavad Gita is high philosophy. It's not for the common man. That's a fact. Bhagavad Gita, in other words. Uh, so what can you do? You can, two things. You can, you can give them food that is offered to Krishna. Just like in the Christians, they talk about blessed, blessed food. So, if we if we go into the kitchen and we prepare food to offer to Krishna, more specifically, we offer actually to the Guru first yeah. to offer to Krishna. That is a very powerful thing because your consciousness, when you go into that kitchen, is not I'm not cooking for my own tummy, or my fiance, or my mother, or my father, or my kids. No, I'm cooking for the pleasure of the Lord. Yeah. Like that. It's an offering. You see, you can offer. So, <clears throat> when that happens, of course it has to be vegetarian, because Krishna is vegetarian. Um, so you're offering the food stuff, and Krishna accepts that food stuff. He accepts that offering by the grace of the Guru who offers it to him. And when he does that, it becomes spiritualized. Yeah. It is yes. no longer anything material, yeah. exactly. It, it becomes spiritualized, and it is called prasadam. Prasadam actually means the Lord's kindness or mercy. So by taking that food stuff, you are receiving the Lord's mercy and kindness through the food stuff. How wonderful is that? How powerful is that? to eat. This is the amazing thing. Krishna sees, eats with his eyes. So we have a temple, and Krishna is there in the temple. He's called the Archa Vigraha. With the deity form of the Lord. Because our eyes at the moment <clears throat> are imperfect. We can see that. Right now, it's dark. I cannot see the stars. They are there, isn't it? The stars are still there, but I can't see them. Why? Because there's no light. The light of the sun. So my eyes are not perfect, isn't it? The same with my ears. There are sounds I can't hear that even a dog can hear. Hmm? So our senses are not perfect. So therefore, I can't even see everything material perfectly. What to speak of spirit, which is far more subtle. Hmm? So, uh, <clears throat> so this is the thing that uh, Krishna, we can't see, and Krishna's body is spiritual. He, he has a form like ours, it is human-like, but his body is not like ours. It is two arms and it like that, but it is not like ours. It is, his body is transcendental. His body is sat-chit-ananda. Sat means that his body is eternal. My body is temporary. Chit, his body is full of knowledge. My body is achit, ignorant. Yeah? I don't even know what my cats are doing next door. Uh, <laughs> Such it. Ananda. Krishna is always blissful. You know, is he, Krishna is always smiling. Is he, he everywhere or is he somewhere else? He is, uh, let me just carry through that Go point. Such it ananda vigraha. Vigraha means he has form. He's not formless. He has a form. A human-like form. Mm -hmm. You can see, he's the color of a blue rain cloud. Plays a flute, he's a coward boy. Uh, but that body, that transcendental body, is eternal. Mine is temporary. And his body never gets old. You never see pictures of Krishna older than 16, 20 years old. No. This, is, this is the Supreme Lord. Uh, so, how do I connect with him? That is the thing. That is the thing. How do I connect with him? Yes, he's in every atom. He's also in my heart. He has an expansion called Paramatma. He's about the size of a thumb. And he's in your heart, literally. Yeah. 
alongside the soul. He's called the super soul. He's right there. That's the voice of conscience. But we're not so good at listening to that. So he comes from the outside. The spiritual master is his external representation. Because then I can talk, I can speak, I can relate. I can, but from inside I'm not so good. Um, so this cooperation and love that we're looking for to find peace in this world. Because everyone's looking for peace. Isn't it? Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, wow, I really want to have a rough day today. I want to get in a brawl. Okay? And I want to get in... I want to get some red, road rage, you know, let, let me get my baseball bat, you know what I'm saying? No, nobody, you know. We're looking for peace, yeah? Keep, keep, keep it peaceful. But it comes. Just like this prayer, samsara, that we just, the first verse is exactly like that. Samsara dava nala lida loka Trinaya karunya ganaganatram what does that mean? Samsara means this world of birth and death, repeated birth and death, isn't it? Because that's what's happening, isn't it? Every day people are dying, every day people are born, but it goes on and on. Hmm? This is not a one-time life lifetime we have repeated birth and death the soul transmigrates hmm? as the embodied soul krishna says in bhagavad gita as the embodied soul continually passes from boyhood to youth to old age the soul similarly passes into another body of death the self-raised soul is not bewildered by such a change this is krishna himself speaking so the soul is eternal the body changes but this troublesome business of birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, just like my fiancé today, Rosanna, her friend passed away. Yeah, very sad. You know, this birth, death, birth, death. Ah, who wants that? Hmm? Who wants that? So Krishna says, samsara, it is like this cycle of birth and death is like a blazing forest fire. Isn't it? Why? Why do they make that comparison between this birth and death and the blazing forest fire? Because you cannot put out that blazing forest fire by any man-made means. Just like we see these big, 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 big fires in California sometimes. And the fire engines come and everything, yeah? And they come with the helicopters and 